If you couldn't hear that, that was me flickering my lights on and off like you were at a play and they're letting you know the play is about to begin because this podcast is about to begin. But before we continue my first ever journey through the Harry Potter series, just a few quick announcements. First, it's Monday, June 17th at the time of publishing this and Friday, June 21st is the live show for Multitude in Brooklyn, New York. I've been talking about it a lot, but now's the last time I will. I promise you've got to go if you live in the New York City area. If you want to know what I'm doing at the live show for the Potterless segment, it is the long-promised Hufflepuff episode. Remember that time when I first launched the merchandise and I said, ah, I will do an episode about whichever house gets the most shirt pre-orders for all of the house color Potterless shirts. Well, Hufflepuff won, and I never made that episode because I was afraid if I did a big deep dive about Hufflepuff, I'd learn some spoilers along the way. Well, I've finished the books now, so uh, there's no spoilers, so I'm doing this episode. So if you want to see me do a fully Hufflepuff-themed show and give them the love that they so rightfully deserved in the books, you should go to multitude.production slash live and get your tickets. It's going to be so much fun. It's going to be a blast. We've put a bunch of work into the show. I'm really, really looking forward to it. It's going to be fantastic. And of course, if you're not in the area, the audio from this live show will be posted. Do not fret. If you're in Hufflepuff and you're really anxious right now, it's all good. It will be on the Potterless feed at some point in the future, so we're all fine. Again, if you want tickets, multitude.production slash live. Also, as I just mentioned, I finished the books, which is really cool. I am a spoiler-free boy now, which is a fun and weird place to be in. I feel very relieved. I just wanted to thank all of you for being along with me on this journey. I know that we haven't actually reached the last book episode, but now I'm at the point where I get to work on some of the future episodes, like the movie episodes and the spinoff stuff. I just saw Cursed Child so I can make episodes about that. It's really fun and this whole process has been so fantastic and I wanted to thank everyone who sent in letters. The spoiler Facebook group put together a I open at the close thing where a lot of people sent me letters for me explicitly to read after I finished the books and I had a big session where I read all of them at the same time and it warmed my heart. So thanks to everyone who sent stuff there. I really appreciate it. And speaking of things that warm my heart, we've new patrons to welcome to the team. So shout out to Aiden Parziani, Nina Roche, Jamie K. Rindy, Amanda Denton, Ivana Khnatova, Jennifer McDonald, Lady Zuzu 923, David Waldire, Nora Hukala, Quinn, Cassidy Marsh, Teddy Redstead, Jenny Vuong, Daniel Samick, and Melissa A. Geary. A shout out to Georgia Davis, who upgraded to the producer level status, as well as our new producer level patrons, Willie, Itzel Aime Ayala, and Mitch Williams. They join the ranks of Leanne, Vicky, Aaron, Jesse, Natalie, Clow, Frank, Marchismo, Samantha, Juan, Kieran, Abid, Rosemarie, Jill, Maria, Lisa, Romina, Kamel, Russell, Dustin, Audra, Eleanor, Sydney, Billy, Rossanne, Nikita, Taylor, Ali, Amelia, Sean, Sarah, Ben, Rachel, Zachary, Orchid, Vivian, Takari, Haley, Moster, Pinky, Angelina, Ross, Marie, Alex, Brian, Caitlin, Mosin, Grace, Raul, Ingen, Mari, Brianne, Alexandra, John, Jen, Noel, Tao, Emily, Robin, Will, Liz, Mariah, Brandon, Sarah, Claire, Teal, Rory, Gloria, Sarah, Patrick, Alicat, Hallie, Veronica, Kevin, Lada, Noah, Tracy, Carlos, Pam, Colleen, Jennifer, Friede, Ivor, Naomi, Tyler, Summer, Heather, Vera, Kerry, Andrea, Ella, Anthony, David, Elisa, Lynn, Cameron, Justin, Christine, Jacob, Toothless, Maya, Mark, Polly, Surgeon, Brittany, Nita, Tumnus, Remney, Matt, Sarah, Nona, Zena, Emily, Colleen, Harlan, Wouter, Sheldarp, Noelia, Addy, Brian, Washin, Jenny, Nikki, Cara, Dorcas, Courtney, Kine, Amanda, Sabrina, Alicia, Kafir, Lindy, Marta, Benjamin, Tajinder, Skymart, Sarah, Peter, Yash, Marta, Stephanie, Justine, Aaron, CJ, Eileen, Kate, Violet, Hannah, Kat, Lindsay, Elizabeth, Fielding, Stephanie, Keegan, Miranda, Gail, Mr. Folk, Heather, Adam, Jesus, Christina, Maya, Zachary, Kieran, Ariel, Heaven, Callahan, Christy, Lily, Wire Warrior, Floor, Siri, and Can't I Potter? who never get little bits of eggshells in the pan when cracking eggs. It's always a clean break. If you want to be like one of these patrons and get access to bonus episodes, director's commentary, exclusive live streams, exclusive merchandise, you can head on over to patreon.com slash Potterless. But without further ado, let's get into episode 81 of Potterless, covering the first part of chapter 31 of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, guest starring my best bud, Johnny Frolicstein. Hello, Internet, and welcome back to another episode of Potterless, the tale of a 27-year-old man reading the Harry Potter series for the very first time. My name is Mike Schubert. I'm that grown man, and I am here joined by my best friend and the biggest nerd that I know, Johnny Frolicstein. Johnny, how's it going? It's great. Thanks for having me back. Also, 27-year-old man. I know, right? It's still strange for me to say. Wasn't it like 18-year-old man when you started this? You were like a 15-year-old reading it for the first time. (laughs) 
<laughs> I was 24 when I began, very quickly became 25. Now that I'm 27, I have since, and this will now be in the past when this actually gets released, I'm rebranding all of the stuff to say grown man. I didn't feel like I could, in good conscience, call myself a grown man at age like 26. No, that's right. But now, at 27, I'm in my late 20s officially, so I feel less weird. It's like a better bumper sticker than like grown man reading a children's novel as opposed to... 25-year-old man, it's, that's less yeah. clunky. Grown man just sounds better, but, and I knew people are going to do this, and Hannah McGregor even called me out on this when I first had her on the show, is that a couple times I would say grown man, and then she'd be like, you're 25. <laughs> you're a child. For the record, you might be a grown man in age, but you're not a grown man in, in, in maturity in, in, level. You, you're no. a child. You're a child. <laughs> Yeah, definitely not the most mature person, as anyone who listened to our Maturity Corner bonus episodes would know. Uh, not necessarily our strong suit, but here we are. <laughs> We're back. <laughs> so let's get right into chapter 31, which is called The Battle of Hogwarts. This is going to take two episodes. I know right off the bat, this is not going to be one episode. This is going to be two for one chapter because so many things happen. In that spoiler group on Facebook, it's always been like, when's it get to chapter 31? When's it get to chapter, like, well, you know, what's going to happen? Chapter 31. That's like, this is this is big for you. <laughs> I mean, yes, as we will cover, there's a lot of big things that happen. So let's... Let's get right to it. So, we begin the chapter with everyone, ghosts included, being in the Grand Hall looking at McGonagall. And we finally get a little bit of HBIC McGonagall, where <laughs> she's in charge. And I wanted this so badly, and I'm so glad that we finally get it, because it's just perfect. Yeah, yeah, she's boss. This is where she belongs. 100%. She's in her element. So she explains the evacuation procedure. And Ernie McMillan surprisingly stands up at the Hufflepuff table and asks, what if we want to fight instead of evacuating? I'm very proud of Ernie McMillan for establishing himself as a good dude. Huge win for Ernie Mac. Um, but okay, so you're, if you're in Hogwarts, do you evacuate? Oh, hell no. Hell no. Really? Mm -hmm. You know what's coming. You know it's going to be like a murderous total warfare type thing. Dude, I'm staying. I have to. Wow. You're a true Gryffindor. I mean, yeah. But also, like, yes, your life is at risk, obviously. What if Kelly wasn't there, right? Like, oh, God, there's so much to think about. I know it's sort of like weird thinking about it in this fantasy book world, but like, for me, putting myself like, I, I would think I would totally evacuate and I wouldn't blame anyone who left, right? It's just like, holy crap. Yeah, I mean, it's hard because I'm not actually there. But I think the thing is, I think what would give me resolve is that I know that the Death Eaters are probably going to focus on the Order of the Phoenix members and Harry. Like, I don't think... I'm a huge risk of death. Yeah, that's a fair. Because, <laughs> like, I, I don't, as a random Gryffindor there, I wouldn't feel like I would be a target. And if you were really concerned, I don't know, you could play it safe and, and kind of hide behind stuff. But I don't know. It would just be one of those things where if I wasn't a part of it, I would just feel bad. Especially, like, what if you evacuate and some of your friends stay and then your friends die? And you're like, uh, maybe I could have saved so-and-so's life, you know? That's a good point. I hadn't thought about it from that angle. I was I was sort of thinking about it in a vacuum from, like, I'm away at war somewhere else. But it was generally a group of people who got along and liked each other, or loved each other, and, and were, were fighting it together. So that, I think that perspective sort of changes where I was at. Yeah, the other thing is, like, the bad guys are big racists, so it's it's a pretty good enemy to unite against. Beat up on some fucking racists. Let's do it. <laughs> Beat him up. So, a Ravenclaw asks what about our things, and McGonagall basically says, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> There's no time to get your things, you idiot. That's like a very Ravenclaw, like, what are the logistics of all this? <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, wait a second. How are we gonna get our items? Yeah. <laughs> Then a Slytherin girl pipes up and asks, what about Snape? And McGonagall says, quote, he has to use the common phrase, done a bunk. Hey, Johnny, is this a common phrase? Wow. I don't know if I've ever heard done a bunk before. I don't think that's a common phrase. <laughs> I mean, I bet that this is a common phrase across the pond. So for that, we're going to turn to our uh -huh. UK correspondent, Dottie James. Dottie, help. And now it is time for British Quandaries with UK correspondent, Dottie James. To have done a bunk means to have done a runner. Run away, to leave, to skip something, to basically just leave. This has been British Quandaries with UK correspondent Dottie James. 
Wow, done a bunk. It is common over there, or maybe it isn't, depending on Dottie's answer. Dottie, thank you so much for that wonderful insight that you are gonna give us. <laughs> she has taught us so many things. <laughs> So the other three tables all cheer when they heard that Snape did a bunk, which we all know what that means now. Yeah, it's the thing Snape did. A bunk. <laughs> he went and did one. He did one. He did a bunk. He did that bunk. But McGonagall then begins to warn about the protections not lasting long. And then she is interrupted by Voldemort's voice. And Voldemort's voice says... <clears throat> I know that you are preparing to fight. Your efforts are futile. You cannot fight me. I do not want to kill you, which, uh-huh, yeah, sure. Mm-hmm, totally. Mm-hmm. And then he goes on to say, I have great respect for the teachers of Hogwarts. Uh-huh, sure. And then he goes on to say, I do not want to spill magical blood, which that one I actually believe. Yeah. But uh, the other stuff, no. And then he ends it off with, give me Harry Potter and none shall be harmed. And I shall leave the school untouched. And you you shall be rewarded. You have until midnight, which makes me think this is the damn Belko experiment, that really bad movie that came out a couple years ago. The Belk, I don't know. It's like a, not a horror movie, but it's like one of those like prisoner, not a prisoner movie. Like a psychological thriller type? Yeah, it's a psychological thriller, like the prisoner's dilemma thing. There's something where it's like, you have to kill three people before the hour comes up, otherwise I'll oh, kill six, and I then the stakes that. get higher and yeah. higher and higher and it's higher. Like, it's like Neo Saw. Yeah. yeah. I also didn't realize, and we'll learn later, that it's 11.30 when he says this, so it makes a little bit more sense. At first, I didn't realize how late it was, and I just thought him picking midnight was very arbitrary and silly. So talking like war tactics for a second, this, this it wasn't a good strategy by Voldemort, right? Like, to give them an extra half an hour to prepare. Like, he had to know that they weren't just going to make it easy. Maybe he was buying time for himself. Yeah, that's a fair point. Like, maybe they wanted 30 minutes to rally the troops and stuff, too. Like, get rank and file set up and everything. Yeah. Right. Get all their own giants in motion, which we learn is a thing. Dude, shit gets crazy. Shit gets so crazy. <laughs> it's absolutely bonkers. So... Everybody looks at Harry at the same time, which is fantastic. And then Pansy Parkinson stands up and screams, he's right there, grab him. Oh, boo, which, boo. Oh, boo. <laughs> the worst. So all of the tables, except for the Slytherin table, get up to defend Harry. They all turn their backs towards Harry and face Pansy in a big unified sign of fuck you, Pansy Parkinson, which is absolutely fantastic. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's just, fuck Pansy Parkinson. <laughs> <laughs> they all have their wands pulled out as well. And then McGonagall chimes in and says, thank you. Mi oh, sorry. <clears throat> thank you, Miss Parkinson. You will have <laughs> you will leave first with Mr. Filch. Now, if the rest of your house could follow. Hey, how's it going? Editing Mike here. <sighs> Look, I also don't know what past Mike is doing here. He's. He's got like a Scottish-Irish hybrid going on, and it's the second week in a row of this, and, and I just want to apologize on his behalf for every Scottish listener, every Irish listener, and just every listener. This is just rough. I'm very sorry. Anyway, back to the episode, which I love. I love that McGonagall, as we saw last chapter and now this chapter, just has no patience at all for Slytherin House at this point, and it's fantastic. Yeah, I think she's really handling the whole thing intelligently because she gave everyone the chance to, I mean, I guess they don't inherently have to redeem themselves as members of Slytherin, but she gives all of them the chance to not be in like the group of dirtbags, right? Right. Like, which is awesome. And then when they're like, no, we're not going to do that. She's like, okay, like, later, deuces. <laughs> yeah. And, and the fact that no, am I correct that no Slytherins stay behind? Like absolutely zero, um, except for the three shitty ones that try to bring Harry into Voldemort. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you count Slughorn, um, but I think everybody else is out of there. Like every single Slytherin student leaves. I don't have my book with me just for everyone, if you're going to like, you know, destroy us on Twitter. <laughs> but I think that's right. I, that's, that's what I wrote down. And I don't understand when people make the complaint that I'm too harsh on Slytherin, blah, blah, blah. My theory always was that there were some good Slytherins. We just don't hear about any of them. But the fact that none stay, zero stay, that's ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's like Slytherin is one of those groups where you're not inherently bad as a part of it. But something about the culture of that group has 
created this environment where they're all ending up being racist or, you know, most of them are ending up being racist or, you know, whatever other negative adjectives you would describe. As so I don't think that the qualities of someone in Slytherin are inherently bad, you know, for, for example, people not in the magical world or in J.K. Rowling's world who identify that way. I don't think they're bad people and I don't think those qualities are bad. I just think that whatever culture has been built at Hogwarts in Slytherin has sort of lent itself to that type of behavior. Yeah, that's probably correct, is that there still could be some good people, but I don't know. I just found it absolutely wild that not even one hung back. And also, that could have been a really interesting plot point. Like, that would have been fun and creative if some stayed behind. Jimmy Slytherin's like, I'll stay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, like even one that we've heard about that we don't know that's that bad. I don't know, like Zabini maybe. Yeah. What if he's like, you know what? Fuck this. And he stays. That would be so cool. Like, fuck yeah, Blaze. Like you could have a scene where him and Pansy have a back and forth and he stands up. I, I just, I think that'd be really interesting. Yeah, it, they, they were a little boxed in um, in the scene, but it's what happened. I guess they, they all, they all bitched. Yep. They all bounce. So the younger kids leave and some of them like Peaks and Creevy try to stay behind and McGonagall yells at them, which is great. Mad props to Creevy. And Harry then goes over to the table where the Weasleys are sitting and he asks where Ron and Hermione are. And before Arthur can say anything other than no, he doesn't know where they're at, Kingsley takes the podium and Kingsley Shacklebolt reveals that it's 1130, which makes that midnight thing make more sense. And he starts to lay the groundwork for the plan. So wait, at this point, where do you think Ron and Hermione are. Do you have any idea? Um, so I thought they were going to be in the Chamber of Secrets. I said this in the previous one. I thought that the diadem was going to be in the Chamber of Secrets. And I am wrong. Uh, but I thought that they were already going to be there. And then Harry was going to join them to help find the diadem. Man. How would they have gotten to the Chamber of Secrets if they were oh, going to go we'll there? get into what that bullshit. <laughs> Don't worry. Oh my goodness, you are so correct in predicting things that I were that I was going to hate in this chapter. God, thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> you know me so well. Kingsley says that the heads of house, not Slughorn, so the the good ones, are going to take students who want to fight to the three tallest towers at the castle. Then Arthur, Remus, and Kingsley are going to take a group to the grounds. Fred then nominates him and George to guard the entrances to the school. After the plan has been laid out, McGonagall reminds Harry, hey, aren't you supposed to be looking for something? And Harry almost forgot because he's the worst. We go from dumb Harry to super logical Harry in like two seconds. It's crazy. I don't know. Harry really ebbs and flows in this chapter. Oh, yeah. McGonagall reminds him the entire reason of this fight is so that he has time to look for something. And it. he's like, oh, yeah, right. The fact that she is setting up all of the like reinforcements for the castle and then also like having to worry about Harry. She's just such a pro. She's such a pro. She's perfect. Gosh, she's so good. So Harry leaves, but he does not know where to go. He opens up the Marauders map, but he does not see the squad. Harry then tries to focus. He recalls the stationing of Electo in Ravenclaw Tower. And in my notes, I was like, yo, dude, come on. It's got to be in the Chamber of Secrets. <laughs> <laughs> Harry thinks about the diadem, and he remembers that Flitwick said no one in living memory knows where it is. And he's fixated on the phrase in living memory. And then he takes off running. This is brilliant. This is brilliant logic. Yeah, great work by Harry. It's the A leads to B leads to C. Voldemort thought I would go to Ravenclaw. Mm -hmm. No one's seen in living memory. I'll go ask again. Like, brilliant. Go Harry. Right. I thought he was going to run to McGonagall's office and finally talk to the paintings because I've really wanted him to talk to the Dumbledore painting. But if he went to McGonagall's office, he could have asked like every previous headmaster. That's what I thought he was going to do. Wasn't it still Snape's office? Oh, I know right. That he just did a bunk, which you know I did three of last week, but it was still Snape's office. That's true. Not McGonagall's. Darn it. Yeah, and I bet Snape had some sort of protective lock on it that Harry wouldn't be able to get through. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so as Harry is running, he sees kids entering the room of requirement, and he notices Zachariah Smith pushing over first years so that he can get to the front and escape before them. God. Which 
I like something that is a constant theme in this chapter is characters that we've heard of establishing themselves as good or bad or so good and the worst. (laughs) Pansy speaks up and we're like, oh, right. Pansy fucking sucks. And then Zachariah Smith does this and we're like, oh, Zachariah sucks. And Ernie McMillan pipes up and we're like, oh, Ernie's great. And either Colin Creevy or his younger brother or both try to stay behind. So they cement themselves as also being very good. I love those Creevy. (laughs) And then later on, we'll get the crab thing where crab and Goyle are interchangeable. But then they use this chapter to be like, oh, crab's the worst one. And also we're going to kill him. (laughs) Woof. Oh, my God. Yeah, we'll get there. (laughs) (laughs) But I feel like it's a lot of things where it's like characters that we've heard about. And J.K. Rowling, before we never see them again, has to let us know this one was good. This one was bad. That's a good point. She's just giving us a little like nice reminder. (laughs) So Harry then sees nearly headless Nick and yells out for him. And at this point, I realize what he's going for. And it is, as you mentioned, a brilliant plan. So he asks Nick who the ghost of Ravenclaw Tower is. And that I thought was interesting because why? I guess this has to be something J.K. Rowling planned because we know about the ghosts for the other houses, right? That's right. She's the only one. Because the Baron is, is he Slytherin's? He's Slytherin. Who's Hufflepuff's? The Fat Friar, who is referenced, I think, in the first, one of the first couple of books. Okay, yeah, I knew it was the fat someone. Super insignificant, like the rest of Hufflepuff in these books. Also, not great that we've got the Fat Friar and the Fat Lady. Not a good look when those are the official names of people. Yeah, love it. You know, just just love, but yeah, but I'm sure that they were like marched for like human rights or something that should have come out within a week. <laughs> So nearly headless Nick reveals that it's the gray lady, apparently, which also is just not a great name for a ghost. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah, it's the gray lady describing the that's the gray one. And then you've got the gray guy and you've got the other gray guy (laughs) and the other gray lady. (laughs) So Harry asks where she is and Nick points her out. And I was listening to the audiobook for part of this chapter. Stephen Fry's nearly headless Nick voice is incredible. Oh, I've not heard it. It's the most pompous thing ever. It's like, oh, Harry, the gray lady is the ghost of Ravenclaw House. Like, it's very proper. And Harry, my dear boy, it's very good. It's really interesting to me in this chapter, and I think it was probably the chapter before, this, like, sort of almost cult of personality that's developing around Harry with respect to Gryffindor. Mm -hmm. This has happened twice now where it's like we have Harry walking up to McGonagall and asking about Ravenclaw and McGonagall sort of like affronted for a second. And we have nearly headless Nick who is offended that he would ask about, you know, a Ravenclaw ghost as opposed to his ghostly services or whatever he says. Mm -hmm. And so it's really interesting how proud to have that connection to Harry these like Gryffindors are Uh Um, I don't know I just thought I I, I make a link between what happened with McGonagall and what happened with Nick in terms of like they're both like wait no not Ravenclaw like Gryffindor yeah that's interesting I mean he is such a defining figure for Gryffindor as a house that it makes sense oh totally totally and, and same with McGonagall, right? Like, right. Yeah, I just love that comparison. Hey, editing Mike here. So going back and listening to this, I think Johnny and I were talking about different people when I said he is an important part of Gryffindor House. Me, meaning Harry, and him, meaning nearly headless Nick. But I think it kind of works because they both are iconic parts of Gryffindor House, just in different ways. So I think it was kind of funny, but I think it worked out. Anyway, here's the podcast. I like it a lot. So Harry chases after the gray lady and he finally flags her down and asks about the diadem. And she's very haughty and very condescending throughout this whole conversation. And she says that she cannot help him. She's like, oh, you're not the first to inquire. And Harry just has no patience for the situation. And I love it. He says, this isn't about trying to get better marks. It's about trying to defeat Voldemort. (laughs) Basically, he's basically like, like, you know, Voldemort, you ever hear of him? This isn't school. This is literally an existential threat. Like, <laughs> <laughs> We are going to die. I'm not trying to get better marks on my OWL. <laughs> Now's the time to ask her about this right now. <laughs> so she says that her mother is the owner of the diadem, thus revealing that she is related to Rowena Ravenclaw. Her name is Helena. She still thinks Harry inquiring for the diadem is about smarts, and Harry is absolutely frantic for information. Rowena Ravenclaw was just sick of the alliteration name thing. She's like, fuck this. I'm naming my child Helena. (laughs) (laughs) A good choice. A very good choice. Thank you. Thank you, Rowena. Harry is about to give up, but then finally 
can get it out of the gray lady. She reveals that she stole the diadem from her mother. Apparently, Helena wanted to become more clever and more important than her mother, so she stole it. And Rowena never admitted that she lost it to anyone or that she knew where it was. So basically, it was this big secret that it had been lost in the first place. And then eventually, when people realized it was lost, no one had any idea of where it had went. Right. Rowena then got ill and wanted to see Helena, even though she had stolen this and Rowena knew and she ran away. Rowena still wanted to see Helena before dying. So she sent a man who used to love Helena. Rowena knew that this dude was going to search the ends of the earth to find her. And it was a person that Helena had spurned the advances of in the past. So this guy tracked her down and finally found her. And when she refused to come back with him, he got violent. Oof. The big reveal is that this is the Bloody Baron. So the big reveal is that we just found out that the Bloody Baron, like, browses fucking incel Reddit. Like, <laughs> toxically masculine. Like. <laughs> also, how awkward is it that they're both the ghosts and they're both at Hogwarts? Oh, they yeah. see each other all the time. It's been awkward for thousands of years. It's been awkward for so long. <laughs> awkward for eternity. <laughs> and, like... There's one point, too, when I think she's like, you know, he wears those chains as a symbol or whatever. And she's like, as he should. Just like, <laughs> so he's like, like, they're sort of over it, but like a little bit of salt. Also, what is the selection process for the house ghost? And is it a lifetime term oh, or do they rotate? Fascinating. I have no clue. Like, when did they start? Did they all join at the same time? Were there different ones? Are they actually assigned an official or is it just kind of an unofficial thing where Helena just hung out around Ravenclaw all the time? <laughs> so she just became the Ravenclaw ghost. Like, you're not going to leave. You're going to be our ghost. You, you can't. There's no in between. <laughs> I got I, I got to know. My new headcanon is that Professor Binns interviews them Ooh. when there's a vacancy because he, you know, he, he's a ghost. Yeah, but he wasn't a ghost from the beginning. Yeah, that's, well. Who knows if they were the ghosts for the houses from the beginning? I don't you. Yeah. I, you're right. There's not a lot that we know about these guys except for who they are. Like, do they have tenure? <laughs> <laughs> uh, do they do anything? Like, you don't really want to talk to I a don't, ghost. Yeah. Do they have a responsibility? And also, the ghosts are, are here as part of the fight. Can the ghosts, like, do anything? Like, the statues can do stuff. Can the ghosts do stuff? I think they can, like, make you feel cold. Like, are they Patrick Swayze ghosts where they can <laughs> affect and do some things? I know that's, like, technically what a poltergeist is. Are these... Uh, uh, I, uh, so many questions. I think they can't because we saw at N Nearly Headless Nick's death day party that they just had to, like, go near the food and they could almost smell it or whatever. Right, and right. And then I also think that Peeves can affect the world, and he is called a poacher yes. guy. So I think that's the ghost model that's been employed here. And it's consistent. Give her credit. It's consistent throughout. <laughs> <laughs> so after revealing that it was a bloody baron, she says that he stabbed her to death and then killed himself immediately afterwards out of remorse. And he wears the chains as an act of penitence. As you mentioned, she says, as he should. Helena says that she hid the diadem in a hollow tree in Albania. Bo which, oh, great, Albania. So we know Voldemort totally got it. And then Bertha Jorkins found it, and she liked it. <laughs> <laughs> so Harry then realizes why she is telling him and didn't tell Dumbledore or Flitwick. And it's because she already told Voldemort. Mm -hmm. And Harry is thinking that Voldemort got it right after graduating from Hogwarts and then later used the same woods where this was hidden as a refuge to lie low for 10 years when he was escaping from the wizarding world. Mm -hmm. You ever been to Albania? I've never been to Albania. I've never been. I also could not come close to pointing it out on a map. Oh, you're so right. I, yeah. Do you have any idea? My guess would be like Balkans, somewhere near-ish, like maybe north of Croatia. Eh. I, I, I have no idea. Hey Siri, where is Albania? Okay, here's Albania. Oh, it's 4,633 miles away from me. Okay, sweet. That helps. <laughs> I'm going to hit directions. Can we ask UK correspondent Donnie James? Will she know? <laughs> Oh, it's adjacent to Greece. It's in between Greece and Montenegro. I was pretty close. Yeah, I would have thought it was like closer to Turkey, uh, like in the yeah. Bulgaria area. It's not like too far, but I would have thought it would have been a little more east. The Bulgaria area? <laughs> the Bulgaria, <laughs> if you... <laughs> 
Well, <laughs> apparently the capital, or at least the biggest city on Apple Maps is Tirana. That's not where Voldemort was. He was in the woods. He wasn't in Tirana. He wasn't frequenting the, the tourist sites in, in, in Tirana. <laughs> what do you do in Albania? <laughs> you go to the forest and you, you hide you hide, you hide tiaras. You lay low. <laughs> you hide your quinceanera tiara or whatever the fuck a diadem is. <laughs> Did you say quinceanera tiara? That, I, that's my understanding of a diadem. <laughs> I'm super upset that I moved to Texas when I was 14 and then I went to an all boys school. So I didn't know a lot of ladies. I didn't meet a lot of girls during my high school tenure. No quinceañeras. That sucks. Well, I got, yeah, I got invited to zero quinceañeras. I didn't make like solid female friends until like my junior year. And by that point, everybody's already had theirs. So my only experience with quinceañeras is seeing people take pictures of them, which happened at Rice where we went to college all the fucking time. They look awesome. They, they look awesome. Dude, the dress is incredible. Yeah. My idea of a quinceañera is like MTV's My Super Sweet 16, except not shitty and featuring the worst people. Oh, that's exactly right. Right? It's just like a family that really loves their daughter and wants to put on this big party, and it's not awful and the worst and terrible. It's just like very genuine. And also the dresses. Oh, my goodness. Did you go to bar mitzvahs? Because if you moved when you were 14, yeah, at least yeah, yeah, you yeah. got the bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs. That was a joy of, for growing up in the Northeast for me. I went to two bat mitzvahs, and those were hype. That's, yeah, they are. They're awesome. Yeah, it's like a more extreme version of a wedding where, at least to me because I'm Catholic, the religious part of it was completely lost on me, especially because it's all in Hebrew and I have no idea what's happening. And then the party part was like crazy hype because you've got all the traditions and the big line dances and the circle dances and then the chair throwing. And they've all got like chocolate fountains and phone booths with cash in them. And it's just like incredible. Exactly. Since they're garnered for kids, they're way sillier. So it's it's like an amplified wedding. It's a silly amplified wedding. That's a great way of putting it. The boring part is more boring and the fun part is more fun. You know who didn't go to any bar and bat mitzvahs? You. I did. The the, the wizarding world because there's literally no <laughs> Jewish people. <laughs> oh, nice. Except for the goblins, maybe? Hey, God. <laughs> Even if she didn't do it on purpose, the caricature is too much to overlook. Yeah, I'll say this here because I've said this on social media and stuff. With some of the stereotypes that J.K. Rowling fell into, I get that they're probably not as big of a deal in the UK. And I get that she probably didn't do them on purpose. And I also know for some of them, like the goblins, that traditional mythology has defined what goblins are like. Those are still pretty bad caricatures of Jews. This all being said... By the time these books are coming around, after the first couple got huge, and you've got a team of editors, I'm assuming, across the world, like, someone in the editing room has to stand up and say, yo, I don't know if you knew this, but, like, this is a bad look. Maybe it was a workplace culture thing. Maybe they had cultivated this thing where, you know, you're afraid to speak <sighs> up. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. So, like, someone, some editor's got to be like, hey, this isn't great. And I know it's like a thing of the times and back then they weren't as representative as things are now, but still, like somebody's got to say something, man. I'm with you. Oh. I'm with you. I know, but uh, so it goes. Uh, such is these books. <laughs> yeah. So Harry knows that the diadem is not going to still be in the forest. And then he has a Jimmy Neutron brain blast <laughs> and he realizes he knows exactly where it is. He remembers grabbing the actual diadem itself and putting it on a statue in the room of requirement when he was trying to remember where he left the textbook because there was so much stuff in there. He put a wig and then a tiara on some sort of bust to let him know where he kept his book. And now he's realizing Dude, that that is the diadem. In my mind right now, like, bravo, JK. Yeah, this is incredible. She laid the groundwork and then she pulled the strings and then they came together in this beautiful knot. And it's just, oh, so good. Yeah, this moment itself made me reconsider doing some episodes of Potterless where I go back on the books. I don't want to go back and be like, hey, now it's the story of a grown man reading Harry Potter for the second time, because that's <laughs> stupid. But what I do think I might do is just like one episode per book, now that I've finished everything, just like reread the books 
or something and try to look at all the little hints and just pointing out and talking about all of those. I think that could be really fun and worthwhile, especially because I know a lot of hints were laid out in the second book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For things that happen way later down the line and and other little things like that. This alone makes me really want to go back and read the sixth book and see exactly how it went down and just with a new lens be like, oh! Yeah, I think the sentence, it's like one sentence, right? And it goes something along the lines of like, Harry grabbed an old tiara and put it on top of a battered war. You called mm-hmm. it out in your episode and whoever was the guest is like awesome and didn't be like, yeah, we watch out for that. But like, yeah, it, it's literally one sentence and it's, it's where you could mark the book. And it's just brilliant. So fantastic. Very great work by J.K. Rowling. Contrary to what happens later this chapter. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. So after this brain blast. <laughs> we have had Nickelodeon references in both of our episodes. <laughs> After the brain blast, Harry thanks her. He knows that it's got to be in the room requirement. So he realizes that Voldemort did it when he came to interview for the job position. That's when he placed it in the school. At this point, though, I didn't exactly realize it was the room of requirement just yet because it's kind of vague about it being the tiara that he moved in the actual room of requirement on the statue. It was more of like Harry knew exactly where it was and a little bit later we learned the details. So at this point, I'm still convinced that it's the Chamber of Secrets. Yeah, because you were, you were texting me that and I, I was just like, he probably thinks it's the movie like big bust of Salazar Slytherin that's in the Chamber of Secrets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I even wrote in my notes because... <laughs> Because he's talking about, like, what secret room could it be in? And I wrote a note, it's like, did Harry literally forget that there is a chamber that no one knows about called the Chamber of Secrets? <laughs> that's where the secrets go, Harry. Come on, Harry, that's where the secrets go. The Horcruxes are pretty secret. You gotta, you gotta go check that place out. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, while Harry realizes this and starts to run, a large body breaks through the window. And it turns out to be Hagrid and Fang, which is much better than potentially like Fenrir Greyback or something. Yeah, we got we got good guys flying through the window instead of bad guys flying through mm-hmm. the window. And the reason that Hagrid and Fang were flown through the window is because Garop just kind of chucked them through a window, <laughs> which is a great visual. It's so good. <laughs> At this point, the clock strikes midnight. So the battle has begun. I kind of like the notion of like, you know, old like Braveheart style movies where the leader is like, hold. (laughs) And then it's midnight and like all the dead leaders are like, ah. (laughs) I love it. Hagrid says that he heard Voldemort's voice echoing all the way up in the cave that he's been hiding out in and came down to help. He asks where the squad is and they go to look. The narrator says that the first casualties are then seen by Harry and Hagrid. And it's in the hallway in front of them, which I thought at first was very abrupt, but it turns out just to be some gargoyles. But like, narrator, (laughs) really playing with my heartstrings right here. Because I thought it was going to be like, he sees Justin Finch Fletcher, or whatever his name is, in the hallway dead. Like, I thought it was going to be some student we knew but didn't care that much about. And I just kept thinking, yo, narrator, come, come on. I don't want to make any jokes about this because I don't want you to know what the casualties end up being. So I'm just going to say, yeah, yeah, that was that was silly word choice, narrator. <laughs> <laughs> so the destroyed gargoyle turns to Harry and says, oh, don't mind me. We'll just lie here and crumble. <laughs> like, Mr. Gargoyle, nobody's worried about you right now. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> so much more important things on the line. Seeing this gargoyle makes Harry think of Xenophilius' bust, which makes him think of the Ravenclaw statue in the tower, which makes him think of a statue that he put a wig on himself in the chamber. That is exactly when it all comes together. The narrator then goes on to say, quote, Tom Riddle may have thought he was the only one to penetrate the depths of Hogwarts, which makes me think of the meme that goes around with Tom Riddle from, I think, the second movie, and then Rebel Wilson's character (laughs) from Pitch Perfect saying, like, not a good enough excuse to use the word penetrate (laughs) (laughs) i don't know if jk rowling's use of penetrate and grope and all of those other ones are more than the average fantasy writer i I think it might just be it just keeps coming up and it's just funny to notice because we're children still (laughs) yeah here's what it is first off in the uk it's much more common Second, I think also in fantasy is much more common. I've had a lot of people tweet me grope and ejaculate being used in other books, and it's all European authors. My complaint always with it was in the English versions in the U.S., they always change some of the words. Like they change mum to mom, and they'll change British words, as we discussed in a previous episode, like disorientated to disoriented (laughs) and putting things in the American spelling. So I always wondered why can't they just change grope and ejaculate to feel 
and yell. Couldn't the U.S. editor know that these aren't very commonly said phrases in the U.S., especially for, oh, I don't know, children's books? Yeah, I hadn't thought about it that way. That's a good point. But what someone brought up, which I think makes sense, is that there's probably more of those edits in the first book. Like, even the first book has a different title because they were afraid kids in the U.S. wouldn't get it. So what probably happened was in the first book, they did a lot of edits to make the Britishisms more American. But as the book goes on, they probably did less and less because they knew people were going to buy the book. So it's less of a concern to go through and find every instance of a British (laughs) phrase and turn it into an American one. Right. So I get it because I have noticed grope and ejaculate happen more and more in like the last two or three books. So I could see that being the case. But also, you're going to have a bunch of eight-year-olds asking their parents, Mom, what does ejaculate mean? Yeah. <laughs> oh, it means yelled, obviously. <laughs> yeah, and then when they get to sex ed, and it says, oh, the man will ejaculate after becoming stimulated. He's going to yell. Go, they, they yell? <laughs> they just, ah! Which, you know, <laughs> I guess not that far from the truth. <laughs> I mean, yeah, not that far off. <laughs> I thought a sports game the other night. Big old ejaculate. No, no, take that out. <laughs> I'm leaving it in. <laughs> So Harry realizes that there is an area that Tom Riddle went to and thought no one else would have gone to that Dumbledore didn't go to. As Harry is making this realization, he sees Neville and Sprout running across the hallway with potted plants. And while they're running, Neville just turns to Harry, I guess mind reading that Harry was confused by what he was looking at and just screams Mandrakes, which I love new Neville. They're going to just throw Mandrakes, which... They have said can kill people, right? I think that they, I think that they kill people. I think if you hear the cry of the mandrake, you die. Yeah, they scream so loud that they can kill people. Yep, I think that's right. (laughs) So very powerful tool to use against the Death Eaters. I don't think that the Death Eaters brought earmuffs to the battle. Yeah, how do you like direct that attack? It feels like it's just going to kill everybody who hears it. Neville says that they're going to throw them over the wall. Oh, oh, brilliant. Mm -hmm. God, they're like the archers. (laughs) It's like Legolas. But with crying baby plants. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Also, Neville's it. hot now. There you go. He's hot now. Dude, Neville 2.0 is incredible. Mm-hmm. He had to get hot because now he's incredible. <laughs> I love badass Neville. So great. One other thing I forgot to say about the reveal of where the Horcrux was was that I was, like, really happy that it's not over-explained in the book. It's not like Harry thought back to when he was hiding the book and then he realized that he had picked up the diadem himself. You know, it was just very like subtle and I think it trusted the reader a little bit more to like figure it out, which I love that. Yes. It was kind of a slow burn realization that you have. And it kind of matches Harry's brain space at this point in time, just because so much is happening that he can't really focus. So the narrator kind of captures that where Harry very quickly realizes, oh, I know where it is, but then he's got to worry about something else. Right. So much so that the narrator doesn't even get a chance to explain it to the reader. So it does a really good job of putting the reader in the brain of Harry and it really makes you feel like you're running next to Harry the whole time and you, while you're reading it, it's as frantic as Harry is. And there's so much going on that it took me a really long time to read and take notes for this chapter. And Kelly, bless her heart, she was helping me out either with, read like sometimes Kelly will read the book to me while I take notes, which is really fun. That's adorable. I didn't know that. I have to ask her to wait while I take notes. But with this particular chapter, especially with all the fighting stuff, I had to keep asking, wait, wait, what happened? Wait, can you Can you read that again? (laughs) Because there's just so much going on. But I think it's intentional and it's really well done. Oh, totally. And I think it especially captures Harry's mindset at the part where in the book it says, Brain Blast! (laughs) I mean, it's the best way to describe it. Dude, I love Jimmy Neutron. That show rocked. Did it, though? I mean, when I was 10, of course it did. Everything on television rocked. (laughs) I will say, I watched the Jimmy Neutron movie a couple years ago. We were having a drinking game party to it. Doesn't hold up. Really? Doesn't? Because I was going to say, upon like two seconds of reflection right now, like Sheen, Carl, awesome characters. Awesome. It's fine. It's not great. It doesn't hold up as well as like SpongeBob. SpongeBob is still hilarious. It's timeless. It's absolutely timeless. Mm -hmm. So the narrator's describing all the stuff going on. There's one point where the narrator says, there are wizards and witches and buffs and britches. And I really just enjoy the rhyming part where the narrator became a rapper for a sentence. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and your thickness. Another thing that the narrator does a ton of in this chapter, the word plinth gets said like 17 times. Really? What the fuck is plinth? A plinth is the base of a statue, 
And I don't know if it said any time before the last chapter. They say it one or two times about the statues rising from their plinths when they come to life. But the word plinth gets used at least three times in the span of a few paragraphs. It's one of those things where once you point it out, you can't not see it. So once Brandon pointed it out in my last recording, it was just plinth, 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 plinth. Well, I mean, it's no crenellated ramparts, but it'll do. <laughs> Yo, but ramparts comes up in this chapter. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> not crenellated ones, but just regular ramparts. Yeah, boring. <laughs> which I don't know if it's ramparts or ramparts, which everybody, when we were saying like ramparts, what are that? Everyone's like, Oh, have you ever heard the Star Spangled Banner before? First off, fuck you. Second off, the Star Spangled Banner doesn't even slap, so don't talk to me about yeah, it. Yeah, that song, it's, I don't like that. It's okay. It's, it's, it's a not a good song. Doesn't make sense. If you need someone tearing it down, listen to Punch Up the Jams episode where they tear it to shreds. No way. But the other reason I didn't think of it is that anytime you sing the Star Spangled Banner, they really lengthen out ram parts into almost two words. Like, they don't say ramparts. It's, it's like the ram. Parts we right. like it's parts of a ram. Oh yeah, that's, not, oh, that I, not that I think that's what it is, but I didn't make the association. Also, <laughs> I've never looked at the lyrics to the Star Spangled Banner before, so I've never read the word ramparts. Well, you didn't go on Genius.com figure out what those parts, what those <laughs> things meant. Yo, I gotta see behind <laughs> the lyrics with Francis Scott Key. <laughs> Uh, I mean, not as bad as when I said underfed. Make fun of me for saying underfed. That shit was hilarious. I sure do. That was very silly. Every day. Every day, please. <laughs> <laughs> UK correspondent Donny James would have, would have ripped you a new one. <laughs> So then you get a really fun moment where Sir Cadogan is running through from painting to painting, giving motivational speeches to people, which I love. He can't leave the painting to fight. So he's just trying to rally the troops. And I think it's so fantastic. Really? I, it's like, it's for me, it's just like, it's not time for your cosplay thing. Sir Cadogan is <laughs> like, stop. Like, I don't know. It's <laughs> like he wa- he's, he's trying to do something and he's cheering people on. That's true. It's like when I'm at a Knicks game and I try to cheer on Emmanuel Moutier to not be so bad at basketball. Basketball. Like he can't hear me, but I'm trying. Or when I cheer on Mitchell Robinson to be such a good, big, long, tall boy. Or when you cheer on James Dolan not to trade Chris Esporzingis. Yo, I'm fine with KP being off. Fuck that guy. He's a snake. Aww. He is, dude. All the stuff that came out no, after we traded him. I'm glad you're at peace. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all the stuff that came out after we traded him was like, you know what? I'm fine with it. He was so sassy and bleh. In a year's time, you're going to have Zion. You're going to have KD. You're going to have Dog. LeBron. You're going to have Michael Jordan. He's going to come out. No, I don't want LeBron. <laughs> I'm kidding. We I'm kidding. LeBron. <laughs> we might have Zion. Dude, oh, man. It's going to be so funny when this one gets posted because I don't know how long it'll be in between, but the draft and or free agency might have happened. Oh. Editing Mike might pop in here real quick for a little <laughs> Knicks-related update that no one cares about. Hey, pal. Hey, Editing Mike. <laughs> Hey, Johnny, editing Mike here with a Knicks-related update that nobody cares about. So since recording, Chris Stapp's Porzingis, in addition to being not so great to the Knicks on social media, also had a rape allegation against him and got into some sort of altercation in a bar in his home country of Latvia. So very firm on my stance of being done with him. In regards to where the Knicks stand in terms of their future, they did not win the draft lottery, so they will not have Zion. The NBA draft is happening in a couple days after posting this episode, and Kevin Durant, who we wanted to sign in free agency, ruptured his Achilles, meaning he'll be out for at least a year. So it's not great, but I'm still hopeful because maybe we'll figure it out. Yeah. (laughs) And sure, the Knicks make my life a little bit harder with all this emotional distress they put on me, but you know who makes my life easier by making the show sustainable? My sponsors. So it's time for Wingardium Adridosa. Today's episode of Powerless is brought to you by HoneyBook. Let's say hypothetically that you are running a joke shop business while you are still a student at a wizarding school, and you're trying to manage all of the finances and admin tasks and all these sort of things that aren't fun for the job, but you have a lot of other things to worry about. You've got to make the wheezes. You've got to go to school. you got to make sure your mom doesn't find out. Ugh, all these administrative tasks can be really taxing and gross, and you want something that'll make that easier. Well, that's where HoneyBook can come in. 
HoneyBook is an online business management tool that organizes client communications, bookings, contracts, invoices, all of that in one place. And HoneyBook makes it simple for you to run your business better. From things like professional templates to email signatures to built-in automation, it keeps everything on track and just makes you look good. And if you're already using some tools like Gmail, QuickBooks, Google Suite, Excel, MailChimp, you can integrate these services and consolidate them within HoneyBook, which makes everything nice and organized and you don't have to start from scratch. And that's why it's the number one choice for client and business management for freelancers, small business owners, creatives, people like me, you can save time and do more of what you want with HoneyBook. I think HoneyBook is fantastic as someone that is a small business owner now, like I am a registered LLC for my podcast creations. I, it sucks putting together this kind of administrative stuff. So having HoneyBook to make it nice and pretty and easy and much more organized than me saying, I'm going to leave this email left as unread and I'll definitely go back and look at it. It's so nice to have a tool like this that can keep everything organized and make sure nothing slips through the cracks. And right now, HoneyBook is offering Potterless listeners 50% off your first year with promo code Potterless. The payment is flexible, so this promotion applies whether you're paying monthly or annually, and you can get 50% off your first year if you use the promo code Potterless. So go to HoneyBook.com, enter promo code Potterless, you get 50% off your first year of the service, and you can run your Wizarding Wheezes joke shop more efficiently with HoneyBook today. Again, HoneyBook.com promo code Potterless. Today's episode of Potterless is brought to you by Stitch Fix. Let's say hypothetically that your school was under attack by a big group of racists and Satan, and you had to evacuate the school, but you were unable to bring all of your clothes with you. Well, now you have to start your wardrobe over from scratch, and uh, you can't put in all this effort trying to go shopping on your own. That's where Stitch Fix can help you reshape your wardrobe. Stitch Fix is an online personal styling service that delivers your favorite clothes, shoes, accessories, whatever, directly to you. Stitch Fix has the brands you know and love, plus exclusive styles that you can't find anywhere else. Ooh, so fancy. With your Stitch Fix account, you create a style profile, answering questions about your preferred style of clothing, color of clothing, fit of clothing, type of clothing, all of these things where an expert stylist, a real human being, can get a sense of the types of clothes that you like, and they will send you a hand-picked box of items directly to your door. You then get to try it all on, keep whatever you want, and put whatever you don't want in a prepaid mailing envelope, and then just ship it back to them, and you only pay for the stuff you keep. It's fantastic. There's no subscription required, so you can choose between automatic shipments or getting things on demand. So if you need it right away, place an order, if you don't need it till later down the road, you can set one for the future. If you want stuff on a monthly basis, you can do that as well. Shipping is always free, returns are always free, and the $20 styling fee is automatically applied towards anything that you keep in your box, so you can save that money as well. I wear the clothes that Stitch Fix sent me all the time. They sent me this one really great pair of shorts that look really nice but have a lot of stretch in them, which is nice because they're shorter shorts, and those kind of shorts can have a problem of being tight on my thighs, but with the stretch that's in these, they're really comfortable and I can wear them throughout the day, and they're so nice to have, especially now that it's getting really hot in New York City. Mmm, love that building heat. And if you want something great like these shorts, you can tell your stylist that with Stitch Fix, and with Stitch Fix, you can get an extra 25% off as a Potterless listener when you keep everything in your box. All you need to do is create your account at stitchfix.com slash Potterless. Again, that is stitchfix.com slash Potterless. Fill out your account, and if you keep everything in your box, you'll get 25% off. So go do that, make your profile, and reshape your wardrobe after Voldemort made you basically abandon all of your clothes today. <laughs> so then there's a moment where they see Fred fighting and he just kind of screams, nice night for it, which gosh, love that guy. Don't remind me what happens at the end of this chapter. Single tear, mm. absolute single tear. Mm. <laughs> then we get a good moment of Aberforth asking about why didn't they take the students as hostages? Like, why didn't they have some Slytherins as hostages for the Death Eaters? Because there's a bunch of Death Eaters who have children in Slytherin house, and Harry hits him back saying that that's not the right thing to do, and it's not what his brother would have wanted, which is one of those perfect things that you you know is going to make someone like it's just the right thing to get Abe's goat. Like it's just the right thing to get Aberforth. Did you say get his goat? Did you just say? Yeah. Because <laughs> Aberforth's like the goat guy. Oh He's shit. Like the goat Patronus. Oh shit. <laughs> Yo, I'm so good at puns. I didn't even realize it. Oh my God. Woof. <laughs> That's crazy. I just subcon. Wow. 
Shout out to my subconscious, man. Also, I, I've never heard get his goat. So if I was you right now on this thing, I would be calling in your favorite. Well, you've you could... never heard the phrase get your goat? No. It's like it's like grinding your gears where it's like the perfect little thing that's going to make you upset. Yeah, the context clues did help. You know, like 35 seconds ago when you brought up Chris Stapp's Porzingis. Yeah. That... <laughs> <laughs> you, you got my goat. I'm a big goat getter. <laughs> so then... Harry finally sees Ron and Hermione, and he sees them with large, curved, dirty yellow objects. What are those? Harry asks where they were, and they say the Chamber of Secrets. And Harry is shocked. I was not so shocked. But then we're going to get into some bad stuff. So they reveal that these dirty yellow curved objects are fangs from the basilisk skeleton. Wait, how'd they get down there? How'd they get down to the Chamber of Secrets? Oh, we'll get there. We'll get there. First, before we go on a big tirade, <laughs> first... That's absolutely brilliant by Ron and Hermione to get the fangs. Get some Horcrux killers while you're at it. I do think it's a bit wild that no one cleaned up the chamber. Like, did they just leave the snake body there to decompose? Oh, wow. I guess so. I guess they were like, I was done with that. (laughs) Right. They just like, no one went back down there to clean it up and get anything out of there. Wasn't the sword down there? Someone went down there to get the sword. Because Harry used it to kill the snake. No, I think he brought the sword with him when he rode up on Fox. Because he gave it to Dumbledore. Okay, right. Here's what I'm now realizing. (laughs) It's probably a really big skeleton. And they didn't want to carry it all up. So I'm imagining they're they're cleaning everything up. And the McGonagall and Dumbledore just kind of look at each other. And they're like, just leave it there. (laughs) But, But couldn't they have used magic to move it? I just think it's strange that Dumbledore knows that these basilisk fangs can be very useful. Why wouldn't he have taken those? Well, if the chamber closed after they left, then they would have needed someone who speaks parcel tongue to get back down there. Yeah, so why didn't Harry, or why didn't Dumbledore use Snape or Harry or... I don't think Snape speaks parcel tongue. Well, why don't you get Harry to do it? That's kind of like, hey, well... Give me, do me a favor. <laughs> Can you do me a solid and just open this real quick? I'll give you some house cut points. Yeah, or some like pumpkin pastels. Or, uh, what, pumpkin uh, pumpkin juice? What, what's the, it's like a treat, isn't it? Oh, never mind, whatever. Uh, you're thinking of puking pastels, which That's make right. you throw up. Yeah, give, give me one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Don't spend it all in one place. <laughs> Hey, Editing Mike here. So Johnny was probably thinking of pumpkin pasties, which is another treat that you can get from the Trolley Witch. And speaking of the Trolley Witch, for anyone that has seen A Red Cursed Child, I just saw the play, and speaking of the Trolley Witch, what the fuck was that shit? Anyway, back to the podcast. So here's where we get into something interesting. Harry asks how they got into the Chamber of Secrets. Hermione reveals that Ron Weasley spoke parcel tongue to get into the chamber of secrets. Oh wait, sorry. You said you said that they brought Harry and they said, "Hey Harry, can you come help open us open this for us?" No. No. They used Ron Weasley, someone who cannot speak parcel tongue, to open the parcel tongue gates to the chamber of secrets. Well, wait just a second. <laughs> how how do we think that worked? <laughs> well, According to Ron and Hermione, Ron heard Harry say it that one time that he used it to open the locket and then shank the locket. Ron remembered exactly what it was. Ron, resident idiot of the group who can't remember what he ate for breakfast, (laughs) remembers not only that Harry used parcel tongue to open the locket and not only exactly what the phrase was, but... He remembers it well enough to repeat it. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to a foreign country before (laughs) and heard other people speak a language, but did you become fluent in a language after people say a sentence once? No, in fact, I didn't learn a single word except for, you know, like, hello. I I certainly didn't learn a word for open. You and I went to Prague together. I have no idea how to say open in Czech. No clue. I don't know how to say anything in Czech. I lived in Paris for six months, and all I learned was how to say, sorry, I don't speak French in French, you which said is well. clutch. Pro travel tip for anyone going to France. Learn désolé, je ne parle pas français, which is sorry, I don't speak French, and everyone in the city will love you. How do you say that in parcel tone? <laughs> I didn't learn anything except for that, how to order food, and how to talk shit in basketball. That's the extent of my French knowledge. You were there for six months. Six months took me to get that. And I know, I think in the movie... 
correct me if I'm wrong, I think in the movie they make a bigger point of Harry talking in parcel tongue a lot in his sleep and Ron using that as justification of how he knew what to say. Yeah, then Ron's just like, Harry talks in his sleep, ha ha ha, like, funny moment. But in the books, all they say as justification is that Ron remembered what Harry said when they opened the locket and destroyed the locket. And I think you and I are like sort of beating around the bush here because we're talking about being able to learn a foreign language that you're hearing. But we've also got to know that like parcel tongue, like no one studies it. You can't learn parcel tongue. Right. right? Like you either have it or you don't. Yes. And you know, it's like it's like this genetic or otherwise thing, right? Like it was passed down amongst the Slytherins for generations or whatever. And it's just like Harry didn't never learned it. It was an innate ability that he had. Right. And so it's not imitatable. It's not like something you can study. He didn't even know when he was speaking it, right? Harry didn't, like at first, when the first time he spoke it. No, for Harry, it's always like an out-of-body experience whenever he says it. He doesn't know that he is speaking parcel tongue. And when people speak it, he doesn't even realize that people are speaking it sometimes. Like with the whole gaunt flashback. Right, and then all of a sudden we get this cheap trick pulled. Like Ron listened to Harry one time say, oh, it's so stupid. The other thing... The part of it being an innate ability is so mind-boggling to me because if you could just speak parcel tongue by knowing what to say, people would learn it. Hermione would already be fluent in parcel tongue. Exactly. If you could learn it. Exactly. One of the most frustrating things about all of this business to me is that like it would not have been hard to write a half a scene where like Harry goes with them to the bathroom opens the thing, and then comes back. Right, yeah. Would have been so easy. Or they find some other way to get into the Chamber of Secrets. Couldn't Ron and Hermione have just done some sort of, like, explosion spell because they know the slide is under the bathroom? Just, like, blow up the floor and go in the slide. There had to have been something. Just destroy the floor. <laughs> or you could destroy our concept of what parcel tongue is. Bam, bam, bam. And then also, I don't know if they use them later, but they don't even use the fucking fangs. <laughs> Like they have, they have oh. the other thing that I'm gonna get mad at in this chapter is they use the fire. So for anyone that remembers last time Johnny was on, he predicted that there would be two things in this chapter that would get me very mad, and I got very mad at both of them. You know me very well. And all of you people on the spoilers Facebook page, you said no, 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 those aren't so bad. I just get to fold my arms and cross my legs and take a sip of my coffee and have that be that. <laughs> I know people are are really trying out for the Olympics with the mental gymnastics oh. to try to justify this. And I know that people are really trying to, you know, learn some new yoga poses by really stretching <laughs> to defend these for not being stupid. Oh, they're stretching. This, I get is, it. this is awful. <laughs> I, I just, uh, everything we know about parcel tongue is that you can't learn it and you like, y you gotta have it. And Ron just bullshits his way around. Oh, yeah, Harry talked like a snake this one time. So I went up to the sink and I just went like <laughs> until it opened. Yeah, what the uh, fuck would you even do? Could you imagine trying to imitate parcel tongue? It, it would sound like what you just did. Something that, that it makes me think of is one of my roommates in college at Rice. His name is Omar. He's from Pakistan. And the correct way to pronounce Omar in his native tongue is some sound that in English we just don't have. It's like halfway between an O and a U, and we just don't have it. And I remember asking Omar on multiple occasions, how do I properly pronounce your name? Like, if I want to go traditional and really try to say your name, like, how does your mom and your dad say your name? And it's something to the effect of, like, Umar instead of Omar, but it's, like, not. I would say it a hundred, I would say this hours on end trying to say it right all the time. And every single time he'd be like, you're kind of close, but it's not right. Yeah, I, I think that's a good example. It's just, like, sometimes if you don't grow up with it and if you don't, you know, have a sound sort of in your repertoire... It's it takes a long time if you're able to learn it. And in Parcel Tongue's case, you shouldn't be able to just learn it. Yeah, it's it's also like the Vietnamese last name Win. I had a buddy in college, Patrick Win, who taught me how to actually pronounce it. But it's this: you use so much of your throat, which is just not a part of the English language, but is a part of the Vietnamese languages, to make a throat noise. Like it, I think the correct pronunciation, and I'm so sorry if this is wrong, but I think it's more like a Win instead of just like Win. But that's why it's spelled the way it is, and just to make lives easier for people who speak English, you just go with Win More so than the Ron and Harry thing, where Ron just picked it up, these are people telling me exactly how to say it and me still fucking it up again and again and again. Also, mad props to people who have names that have sounds that aren't in the English language who, like, have to deal with us mispronouncing everything all the time. 
Mad props to this. Oh, it's awful. I don't see how Ron can nail this from hearing Harry say the phrase open once or twice. Yeah, he heard it twice when they went in the chamber in book two and then the one time with the locket. You're telling me that's enough for Ron to get over this innate ability? It's ridiculous to me. It's absolutely absurd. It's silly. And I think and I think we've beat the horse to death. Yeah. And I think that that's just it. it it's so silly. And it, it, was, it, it feels lazy. That's what kills me. It just feels lazy. The other thing is it doesn't seem necessary. Uh, yeah, that's what I mean. Why couldn't Harry have just found the squad earlier? And they're like, hey, we need to get into the Chamber of Secrets. Why? To get the fangs. Oh, good idea. Can you let us in? Sure. Yeah, uh, check. <laughs> or do you have to do it twice? Do you have to do it in the bathroom and then after you go down the slide? Or do you only have to say it once? Oh, uh, it might have been twice. I, it might- I think it might be twice. I feel like there might be, I feel like you might have had to say something to a statue or a gate once you get down the slide. There's like a little, yeah, snake thing on it. Yeah, mm-hmm. with like an emerald or something. Yeah, there's definitely twice. But even then. He goes there and then he leaves and it goes back up. Mm-hmm. Alas, we didn't get that. We just got Ron doing it for no reason at all. Yeah. <sighs> So then, after explaining to Harry how Ron became a superhero, he explains that he had Hermione kill the cup. Oh, so I guess they do use it. They use a fang to kill the cup. Oh, yeah. So they they don't use it in, like, quote, unquote, on screen. They use it that one time. So, okay. So they do use the fangs. They had a bunch of basilisk fangs. They could have just used those on the diadem. But instead, we get whatever the fuck. We'll talk about that later. (laughs) (laughs) That'll be the angry rant for episode two of this chapter. (laughs) So Hermione killed the cup, which is great and fitting. Ron said that, you know, she hasn't had the chance to kill one yet, so she should do it. I wonder if we'll put up a fight against her. Like, what would the Horcrux putting up a fight against Hermione look like? I don't know, man. It's a cup. What's the cup going to (laughs) do? Yeah, I have no clue. (laughs) Harry then explains that they got to go to the Room of Requirements. So they go, and when they enter, they find Neville's grandma, Ginny and Tonks in there, and I screamed at my book, go home! Yeah. <laughs> you have a child, yeah. what are you doing? Tonks later explains after Harry asking, what the heck, that Teddy is safe with Tonks's mom. So Gran was the last one to go through the passage and sealed it behind her, which is good because Harry realizes that if anyone was in the passageway, they would be trapped there if he changes the room of requirement into what he needs it to be. So Gran asks about Neville, and Harry says that he is fighting. And Gran says, naturally, which I think is so great. And then she leaves to go help him out. Things that make me cry. Her saying, naturally. I wrote that down, too. What a great response. Great response. Harry then asks Tonks why she isn't with Teddy. um, And she goes on to say that she's there because she couldn't bear not knowing what is going down, especially with Lupin being in the fight. She asks where Lupin is, and Harry says that he's out fighting, so she leaves. Harry then says that Ginny has to leave too, and to no surprise, she's very excited to leave the room of requirement. (laughs) (laughs) So she runs upstairs after Tonks, and Harry's yelling, you have to come back when we're done in here. (laughs) Which, she's not going to listen to you, Harry Potter. Come on, get it together. Yeah, it reminds me of that scene in shitty movies where someone's running away, and the guy who likes the girl he's like but you have to come back (laughs) there's no way she's gonna hear (laughs) so at this point ron brings up the house elves and harry asks oh are you gonna ask them to fight and he goes no we should tell them to all get out of here we don't want anyone to end up like dobby and this causes hermione to give him a big old kiss and they just start making out ron picks her up they're going at it playing tonsil hockey (laughs) and then harry has to butt in and say oi there's a war going on here. <laughs> and then Ron's like, well, yeah, might as well do it now. And Harry's like, think you could just hold it in for a little bit. That's literally the best response for Ron, though. It's like, it's a good point. <laughs> yeah. isn't it? it literally is now or never. Like, <laughs> it's very fun. So happy. So it's, this is good. This is just good stuff. And they're they're right for each other. And the Harry Hermione thing mm-hmm. is stupid. And this is great. I, oh, anyone, and I know J.K. Rowling even said that she feels like Harry and Hermione. Anyone that thinks Harry and Hermione should be together, I'm sorry. I get people shipping stuff, but Ron and Hermione are perfect for each other. Come on. It is the quintessential ideal opposites attract couple. They're so great. They bring out the best in each other and neutralize the worst in each other. I totally agree. And I, and I love like the sincerity of this moment and how, you know, that's been building up for like probably two and a half books now, these two. And so I love how 
the moment was after Hermione had been so passionate about the house elves, you know, since book, I guess five, it must, or whatever spew was. I think it was the fifth book. Yeah. And then for Ron to say that, but not say it for his own personal points with Hermione, but he right. was just saying it out of like pure sincerity. And like, that's the moment. Like that's when the, yeah. the hill has been crested for those two. Mm-hmm. You can tell it's a true, genuine concern from Ron and that's fantastic. Yeah. So this was, this was expertly done. Uh, this made me so happy the first time I read it and all the subsequent times. You're right. This is such a great moment. And since it is such a great moment, let's call it a pause here. This will be the page break in between parts one and two of chapter 31. So Johnny, let's cut it here. But how you feeling so far about uh, this part of the book? It's a roller coaster and it's only more of a roller coaster as we go through the next, what, 15 pages. Right. A much more intense wild roller coaster. Like it's about to get way wilder. I think plot wise, though, this is just, I mean, I was really glad that you asked me back to be on this chapter because I love so much the way that the realization dawns on Harry of where the diadem is. Yeah. One of five moments in the book, right, where it's like, there's a bunch of, you know, all the, all of her like things that have laid undetected have like come together and, you know, dawning realizations, brain blast, whatever you want to call it. But, like, you know, he was dead the whole time, mm-hmm. level plot twist. <laughs> um, so I, I, I love that moment. Yeah. There's some really good stuff in here. And I know that we harped on how awful and silly the partial tongue thing is. But aside from that, everything else in this chapter is up to this point is absolutely incredible. It's so well done. It is masterfully done. I think J.K. Rowling does a really good job of writing when the stakes are high and things are really intense. She's a really good action scene writer because she really makes things picturesque and you can see things and feel like you're there. And she does a very good job of making you feel the intensity and the tension. I, I felt like I was in the castle witnessing all of this. It was incredible. You made the point earlier about like Harry's thought process with his big realization, how he was like, you felt like you were having the same thing, like Mm -hmm. just a bunch of disparate images getting connected and then all of a sudden like it hitting you. All the JK bashing is obviously out of love because she set such a high standard for herself that when something silly like Ron speaking parcel tongue happens, it's like, come on, what are you doing? We know you're better than that. Exactly. With any criticism of JK Rowling or these books in Potterless, it's out of love and it's out of respect. And you're right. It's out of knowing that she can do better and that she has done better. So when things fall short of that, it sucks because we have those high expectations for her. And if I didn't appreciate and love these books, I wouldn't doing this. If I just hated these books, it would not have so much love for them. Loving a thing is also being critical of it. And that's with anything. I'm critical of things about the NBA. I'm critical of things about the other pieces of media that I enjoy. I I recognize that things aren't perfect, but wanting to point out those flaws is what makes this show this show. But also, like, it's okay if the things aren't perfect. Like, you're allowed to be a huge Harry Potter fan and not think that these books are completely flawless or J.K. Rowling is completely flawless because no one is and nothing is. Everything has flaws in it. There are some episodes of Pyros with really bad audio editing work. There are some episodes of Pyros where I make big old mistakes. Like, things aren't perfect. <laughs> nothing, like, I know people really want to, like, defend these books all the time and J.K. all the time. Like, it's okay to recognize that there's some flaws and stuff. You can still love a thing and recognize that it's not 100% there. It's chill. I love the books. I love what J.K. Rowling has made here. But when you do things like a very strange workaround of Ron being able to speak parcel tongue that doesn't seem necessary, it just makes me frustrated. And you can love a thing because of its flaws as opposed to in spite of its flaws too, right? Like yeah. everyone knows that J.K. Rowling hadn't been a successful writer before this series came out. And so the fact that it's not this like expertly crafted, you know, Westeros, Game of Thrones level, like mm-hmm. every piece has been laid. You know, she, like she makes mistakes, but it's we, like her story and her imperfection is like really part of, I think, the whole narrative around not only Harry Potter, but J.K. Rowling herself. And so, yeah, I think, you know, the stuff she's doing now in terms of the new information is a little bit silly. Yeah. I know. But within the books, I think the imperfection is, is almost endearing to a level, which, again, I know is, is a little bit counterintuitive, but... Like you said, you know, just the things we love are not perfect. Nothing is people and media and places. And I think that I think that you hit the nail on the head. And the other thing that's frustrating is like, of course, it's her first book series. There's going to be mistakes. And she's owned up to some things in the past, like with the Time Turners. There's a whole thing on Pottermore where she was like, 
I did a very bad job of time travel. That's why I had to murder the time turners. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I just wish you would do that with more things rather than always try to have these workarounds or try to have justifications and all this other stuff or the fake representation of like, oh yeah, there's tons of Jewish kids or like Dumbledore's totally gay and or like Quidditch is the human condition. Like, <laughs> all right, all <laughs> right. <laughs> You're allowed to be like, yo, it was my first book series. I goofed some stuff. Totally. <laughs> like, or, or all you got to do, and, and this is a point people bring up, is that these books were written 20 plus years ago. So you can't expect it to have perfect representation because, you know, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, we weren't as keen on having representation as much as we are now. The society and culture develops and grows. But then you can fucking say that. But all you got to do is just be like, yo, my bad on recasting Lavender Brown as a white girl. We probably should have not done that. Like, all you got to do is just admit to flaws. I think like it takes it takes a lot of character to be able to admit mistakes and, and admit when you're wrong. And like, I tried to do that as much as I can. I know I'm not perfect about it. I admitted that I didn't handle the Johnny Depp stuff super well in these episodes of Potterless and, and had to add something into episode 69. Nice. But <laughs> when I goof stuff in Potterless, I admit it. Like in book four, in book four. Like, yeah, yeah I, I said Harry Potter was the wrong age in Goblet of Fire. Like, sorry, I, uh, oops. <laughs> like, I, I probably should have had better notes. My bad. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, yeah, I think I think there's the level of mea culpa is missing. But in in terms of the series itself, like it's it's you know it's not perfect, and that's fine. Yeah, it's like the you know one sentence summary. And it's just fun for me and you to be like we're not genuinely angry about the parcel tongue thing. It's just <laughs> frustrating and seems very silly. <laughs> no, we're a couple of stupid big dumb idiots, and we, this is what we like to do on Wednesday nights. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, Johnny, thank you so much for joining. I'm very excited to have you for the next episode where we finish up this chapter. Is there anything you want to put out there into the world, promote, share your social, do whatever? Uh, no, I think I'm good. I listen to Maturity Quarter on Patreon because it's, it's. I mean, I guess some people think it's funny. I think it's the worst thing ever. But the but best it's, worst. It's, 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 <laughs> Yeah, of course, yeah. What John was referring to is there's bonus episodes on Patreon where him and I just watch the movie and then put a microphone in front of the couch and we just do very, very silly rants. And it's like a director's commentary of people trying to make fun of the movie the whole time. Very silly. I think it's very fun. It's mystery science theater. <laughs> and if you're a bonus episode tier on Patreon, you can listen to it and you can listen to all of them the second you join. Well, thanks for having me on. It was fun. Yeah, thanks for joining, man. I really appreciate it. And listeners, thanks for listening. And until next time, as they say in the Wizarding World of Harry Potter before they open Have a Chamber of Secrets <laughs> by knowing Parseltongue. <laughs> Wizard on! We all know that sharing is caring, and what better thing to share with your family or friends than the knowledge of Potterless? If you really want to help out the show and make me smile, tell someone that you know would love the podcast about the podcast. It really does help, and it really does mean a lot. Powerless is created by Mike Schubert. It is hosted by Mike Schubert. It is edited by Mike Schubert. It is produced by Mike Schubert as well as Leanne Davis, Vicky Garcia, Aaron Johnson, Jesse Horgan, Natalie Klobuchar, Klaus Serlopu, Frank Chiotto, Marchismo, Samantha Rose, Juan Sanfelio, Kieran Webb, Abita Med, Rosemary Dodge, Jill Boulay, Maria Lisa C. Keen, Romina Rivadonier, Camille Doc, Russell Dunk, Dustin Roland Cooch, Audra Eleanor Curlin, Sydney Cawthorn, Billy Hinton, Rossanne Batamana, Nikita Power, Taylor Armstead, Ali Madsen, Amelia Kraus, Sean Montag, Sarah Nink, Ben Silver, Rachel Guthrie, Zachary Polito, Orchid Girl, Vivian Owl, Takari Ron, Haley Hastings, Moster, Pinky Pan, Angelina Withard, Ross Marie Heise, Alex Bisholta, Brian Williams, Caitlin Sullivan, Mosin Siddiqui, Grace Riggles, Raul Pineda, Ingan Odsader, Mari Wynn, Brianne Wingate, Alexandra Consulver, John Kotker, Jenna Juice, Noel Basile, Tao, Emily Tyrell, Robin Fernandez, Will Barrington, Liz Bigelow, Mariah Noah, Brandon Pickens, Sarah Enslin, Claire Spencer, Teal, Rory Collier, Gloria Gillum, Sarah and Patrick Donovan, Alicat29, Hallie Bowen, Veronica Bartova, Kevin Harnoy, Lada Bartova, Noah, Tracy Toya, Carlos Nino, Pam Webb, Colleen, Jennifer Mark, Lou Frida, J. Svensson, Ivor Peterson, Naomi Guglielmo, Tyler Latra, Summer Rathal, Heather Fleischman, Vera Cullitham, Carrie D. Bagason, Andrea Crock, Elisa Grieven, Lynn Walker, Cameron Watt, Justin Montero, Christine Saunders, Jacob Parrish, Toothless Walnut, Maya Gray, Mark Body, Polly Burge, Srujan Thanmegupta, Brittany Gutierrez, Nita Atabani, Tumnus Moran, Remy Fontaine, Mats Furley, Sarah Shecker, Nona VM, Zena Rosnowski, Emily Tilly, Colleen Mage, Harlan Haskins, Wouter Vandermaiden, Sheldarp, Noelia, Addy, Brian, Wash and Large, Jenny Campione, Nikki Harris, Kara Hamilton, Dorcas, Courtney Hemwood, Kine Roan, Amanda Alfred, Sabrina, Alicia McLaren, Kafir Shaltiel, Lindy Placky, Martha Madueno, Benjamin Desmond, Tajinder Chumber, Skymart Six, Sarah Shedder, Peter Vostanek, Yash Patel, Marta Morrison, Stephanie Magnus, Justine Wade, Aaron Richter, CJ Ochoco, Eileen Jesh, Kate L. Dobbs, Violet Sullivan, Hannah Suzanne Gormley, Kat Yowell, Lindsay Towning, Elizabeth Agathon, Fielding Lee, Stephanie Hofford, Keegan Curran, Miranda Manning, Gail Ann, Mr. Folk, Heather McMillan, Adam Bryant, Jesus Aguilar.
Aguilar, Christina Welton, Maya, Zachary Davis, Kieran, Ariel Rigdon, Heaven, Callahan, and Deras, Christy, Lily Leader Williams, Wire Warrior 4976, Floor Sake, Siri Scarsford, Willie, Itzel Aime, Ayala, Mitch Williams, Georgia Davis, and Kurt I Potter. Web design by Kelly Beckman, and the music is by Bettina Campomanes. If you want to find us on social media, you can go to Facebook.com slash Potterless, Twitter.com slash Potterless Pod, Instagram.com slash Potterless Podcast, or Reddit.com slash R slash Potterless. The website with all the information about the show is PotterlessPodcast.com. All of the bonus content lives at Patreon.com slash Potterless, and merch is at bit.ly slash merch on. Thank you so much for listening, and until next time, as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, wizard on!